this is uh, a great evening for us at the school. This is the first in a series of events called the Inspiring Women series, um, where the school will host a successful business leader, an entrepreneur, uh, or somebody who has led an organization, um, and give our students, our community, and the community around <coughs> Oxford the opportunity to hear some of the stories, particularly from successful women because we don't think there are enough uh, successful stories being heard. Um, and so this is uh, part of a new initiative, which we're really delighted to have Anushka with us for. So Anushka, uh, Anushka Dukas is our first guest. Um, Anushka will be well known to people who wear more jewelry than me. Um, <laughs> but even I um, know a lot about Anushka's first firm, Links of London, because I think it's fair to say you can't open or you could never open a glossy magazine without <laughs> seeing some sort of advert for Links of London. And it really did transform um, the sort of luxury jewellery industry. So tonight we're going to hear a little bit about that. And also about Anushka's current business um, called Anushka. Um, so she is a serial entrepreneur. She's been incredibly successful in her field. Um, but I think it's fair to say um, you see yourself as much as a designer, as an entrepreneur. Um, and you started uh, not in any traditional way at all, but I understand with selling sandwiches. So we'll perhaps hear a little bit about that. So I'm going to, I'm going to start the conversation this evening um, and get us going. So I'll ask some questions um, and we'll... we'll talk a little bit about uh, Anushka's business and how she built the business. Um, but then there'll be an opportunity for all of you to ask questions. Um, and the way we do that is please say who you are. Um, please make your question clear and make it short. No more than one question, no multiple questions. OK, I just said it at the beginning, because then I'm going to have to say it again before we start. Uh, so we want lots of questions. Be thinking about your own questions um, uh, as, as we get the conversation going. So. Anushka, thank you very much for coming. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you here. I said that you you started by selling sandwiches. Um, tell me more. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that actually. So <laughs> I uh, yeah, I went to Australia when I left school, um, really ostensibly to go and see a, a girlfriend, and I loved Australia. So I thought I'd rather than stay three months, I'd quite like to stay a bit longer. Um, so I found myself in Brisbane. Um, and at the time, there was a, uh, a friend of mine here uh, had set up a sandwich business called Burley's. And it was very well known, very, uh, very much kind of luxury sandwiches in the city. And I thought it would be uh, a fun way to stay in Australia, earn some money uh, to set up a sandwich business. Um, so that's what I did with a, with a girlfriend. And um, it was called Lunch on the Run. And the only problem was with the, with the sandwiches that everything I didn't sell, I ate. So I, I, by the time I left Australia, um, I was definitely a different size to when I arrived. It's not, not so good for your entrepreneurial No, it was not so good, yeah. but anyway. But, but did you mean to start that as the way of becoming an entrepreneur? Did you want to be an entrepreneur? Or did you fall into it? Um, I don't think I set out very early on thinking I want to be an entrepreneur because I'm not sure I, I even knew what that meant but I think um, growing up my uh, my mother was uh, has been incredibly um, influential on in my life I guess and um, she was very much an entrepreneur I mean she swapped her first car for six Highland cattle she got the car they got the cattle um, you know so so I think it was kind of been in my blood for a, for a for a long time and when I left school, I, one thing I did know, I didn't want to go to university. I really didn't want to sit another exam in my life. And um, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I thought perhaps I would wanted to go into fashion buying, something like that. Didn't really understand much about what that meant. But I think quite quickly, I realized I didn't want to work for someone else. Um, so I, I mean, I, I, my, I started by working for my godfather, and, and he r had various clubs, Annabelle's, Mark's Club, various, uh, very, very much top, top 
um, quality club. So I learnt a huge amount from him in terms of um, how to do things properly, attention to detail, all of those things. Um, and, and, and then I, I, I guess I thought I, would, I want, didn't want to work for myself. But I, but I, um, I went to Hong Kong. Um, and I went, I really, from Australia, I went to Hong Kong. Um, and having stayed too long in Australia starting this business, um, I ended up in Hong Kong without a kind of onward ticket. So there was no choice but to stay and work. Um, and that was kind of, uh, kind of middle 1985, 86. And Hong Kong at that point was a real land of opportunity. It was an amazing place to be in. I was very young. And um, I was offered a job. Uh, to run Hamptons estate agents. Um, I knew not a freehold from a leasehold, I knew nothing, but somehow or other I managed to get this job. <laughs> um, and in, it was in my, during my time in Hong Kong, I think, that um, such an exciting place where there's so much going on, there's so much creativity, so much industry, and behind every door is something, somebody making something or doing something. And I found that really infectious, I think. So um, when my mother um, rang me f from living here, um, and she had started a fish business, um, and she rang, she said, look up. Being here, sandwiches, fish. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Food's obviously very Perhaps important in my life. too far, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, So she said, she rang, she said, look, I've got, she, she started this fish business. She'd got 60 of the very best restaurants in, in London, from the Gavroche to Claridge's, the Connaught, to all of these amazing restaurants. And all these chefs were men. And she rang, bearing in mind I was an estate agent at the time, and uh, she said, I've got 60 chefs. I need to give them a present. Have you got any ideas? Not really, a lot of ideas. But um, I, from Hong Kong, if you, fantastic place to travel and I had found some uh, somewhere in the Philippines, a craftsman in the Philippines, to make some jewellery for myself. Very simple silver jewellery just because I couldn't find what I'd wanted. So I rang her back a few weeks later and just said, actually, um, I found a fantastic craftsman. Find a f picture of some fish in a book and we'll make them into cufflinks. Mm -hmm. And it was cheaper to make double. So I commissioned 120 pairs of these silver cufflinks and there were fish on one side and fish bones on the other side um, and so um, in the meantime I went back to London uh, moved back to London and um, so I had these 60 I sold mum 60 and I had these extra 60 and I was working for Hampton so I was thinking, what am I going to do so I um, called the buyer at um, Harvey Nichols and <coughs> I'll never forget the lady she called Fiona Duff and um, she said it was a kind of at a time where the only cufflinks you could buy um, were silk knots. I'm sure nobody probably remembers those, but they were kind of silk stretchy knots. Um, and so she she said, I, I can't take one, but if I can, if you can design a collection, perhaps come back to me. And um, anyway, so I thought, well, I'm going to try. Um, so a few weeks later, I went back to her and I'd done kind of pig head, bum on the other side, golf bag, golf ball, all, the, all of those kind of quirky cufflinks. And she said, fantastic, I'll, I'll take all, whatever it was, six or eight. Um, I, was, I went back to my day job. Um, and I, then I rang every friend I knew and I said, could you just go to Harvey Nichols, buy these cufflinks? <laughs> and, uh, don't worry, don't worry, I'll buy them back from you. Um, and, um, and a few weeks later, she said, sales are amazing, absolutely amazing. <laughs> and I think that was the first lesson I learned, that what if your sales team believe you've got something fantastic, they believe in it. So actually, it was self-fulfilling. It was just, yeah. you know. So this is a bit further on from the minimum viable product. You, were, you yeah. actually had the real thing. OK. I just want to um, put up on the screen a, a picture got Anushka first, I think. Uh, That's my packaging. Yeah, now. OK. Perhaps <laughs> we haven't got... I thought we had one of Lynx. We'll, we'll might do. If you think, might uh, do. Should we go there with... Oh, yeah. is that Lynx? Yeah. That's Lynx. That's OK, it. yeah. So yeah. Um, hands up if you recognise <coughs> Lynx or if you know about Lynx. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. OK. Yeah. It's lovely packaging, actually. <laughs> um, so you've got the business going. I mean, the, 
the story about having the product and having the urge to sell the product is something that you hear, you know, you hear a lot from entrepreneurs who are just determined to make those first few sales. But to go from there to what you eventually had was, you know, a huge business with over 40 shops and I think you eventually sold it for around 50 million pounds. Um, tell me a little bit about the first few years and some of the challenges you had just getting that business off the ground from, you know, selling those cufflinks in Harvey Nichols. <laughs> By the way, did you have to buy them back from any of yeah, your friends? Yeah, I did. Actually. Oh, did? Yeah, because okay, I've re, you know, regurgitated yeah, them yeah. again. It's fine. Um, so, so, oh gosh, I mean, there are lots of so many uh, challenges. Right, I mean, right at the beginning, bearing in mind, um, I, I didn't, I didn't go to design school. I didn't do any of those things. So actually, all of that was something I had to really learn. Something very, very, uh, very visual. Um, but the, the, the other side of it is, you know, at the beginning, you have to do everything. So actually, Lynx was, was my night job. My day job was, my mother died rather suddenly, so I ended up taking on her fish business. And I really knew not a cod from a turbot. So I, Lynx was very much my, my uh, night business. So, you know, and, and I had to do everything from, from designing to polishing to, I remember my, First client was um, corp well, did, I was doing, making corporate gifts for ICI, and we did little Dulux dogs um, with a paint can on the other side. And I'd asked for the <coughs> dogs; I wanted the, the noses to be enamelled, but they'd forgotten to enamel, so I'd nail varnish all night doing this. You know, um, and uh, so you literally do everything from invoicing to polishing to counting to you know all of those things. Um, and you know the difficulty is to, to uh, and, and still to try and work out how you're how you're going to let go of some of those things in order to be able to grow a business, yeah. I guess. So scaling up is is the huge challenge. Starting seems the biggest deal, but as you say, scaling up and going from that one tiny deal mm -hmm. to all those shops must have been hugely challenging. And I know that. Uh, your husband John, who who's with us tonight, I know that you know he ran the business with you. But um, what were the big decisions that you had to take in in the first few years? There's always a, a sort of step change where you make decision X, and then suddenly something else happens. Was there you know was there a moment where you thought right that's the thing that is going to help make it the success it became, or was it much much messier than that? No, I mean I, I the first. The first decision was because I'm selling to Harvey Nichols, but the big danger was I, the big issue was I was selling to Harvey Nichols and they were selling it as Harvey Nichols. So, you know, the first thing was I hadn't I hadn't kind of worked out that it was going to be called Links of London at the time, um, and it was only when I was sitting next to somebody who, in PR who said, "Oh, what are you doing?" and I was explaining what I was doing and said, what's it called. I'm like, "Oh, it's called Harvey Nichols, right this minute." <laughs> um, and so the, what the first the first decision I guess was to go to the bank was to go to the bank and um, see if they'd lend us some money, um, mainly to to borrow the money really to to create a corporate identity, to develop packaging, to develop all those all all of those things, and um, you know they wanted guarantees they wanted um, you know me to guarantee my life I think at the time and um, so that was that was a that was a kind of the first the first challenge I guess and then the next one is taking on your first employee that's quite a challenge too it's kind of like suddenly this is serious it's no it's no longer you know something I'm doing at night and you know um, so so as, as that as that developed um, but I guess the biggest step was um, Re going into retail, um, but what I should say is that retail was the last thing we did. Um, so we started it with a wholesale business. We then wholesale first, so selling to third parties. Then um, we started a corporate business, and the corporate business was very much about trying to, because um, from a marketing perspective, the corporate business was. was Perfect because you have 200 clients who are receiving this present, um, and 
they are potential new customers. So the corporate side happened next, and then the retail side was the last thing. And, and you know, John was a lawyer at the time, and he walked past a tiny, I mean, really tiny little shop um, in Broadgate, just above Liverpool Street. Um, and he rang me and said, right, I found a shop. Um, we're going to open a shop. We're looking for a shop. <laughs> but the joy of that was it was an absolutely tiny shop. We were selling tiny, it was set, I think it was like a, a sweet shop or selling newspapers and things. Um, and we were selling very tiny things. Um, and yet, so, so the, the um, revenue per square foot was you know, very, very interesting. Um, but that, I think that was probably the biggest moment of, oh my goodness, you know, the actually, biggest, the biggest yeah. step change. big overhead, yeah. yeah, big overhead, big, And yeah. the decision not to allow the jewellery to be branded by anybody else, to get your identity, keep that brand, how significant was that, do you think, in, in the success of the business eventually? Um, you have to be really brave to do that. So, I mean, I, um, it was very significant. I mean, I had a, um, a client called Mappin and Webb, who are still um, very much around today, um, but they were a very, very big customer, and they would order hundreds of pairs of cufflinks, um, at, but under Mappin and Webb. So they were a really important part of our turnover, and um, and we made this decision. We were going to we were going to sell it. it was, we were going to only sell it in Links of London packaging, and. I remember the day the buyer rang me and she said, I want to place a reorder. And I said, Tracy, I'm really sorry, but I'm only going to sell them to you if you'll take them in my packaging. And I was this kind of intake of breath. And, um, and she said, well, I don't think we can do that. Um, anyway, um, they didn't do that. Um, and that was a, that was a yeah. pretty brave uh, decision, I guess. But I think it, it was absolutely essential because what you can't do is when, when, it, when it's in somebody else's store, in somebody else's packaging, you can't control the environment, you can't control the brand experience at all. So it was really important for me that it was presented the way I wanted it presented. So the business grew and eventually you decided to sell. Um, over 40 stores worldwide already, you know, very, very big brand name. How difficult was it to sell? What what made you, you know, take that decision at that time? I think um, I think I had um, I think I'd always got this ambition that I wanted to sell it before I was forty. And I think that, I don't know, you know, there was a bit of an ambition to do that, but but more importantly, we had four children. Um, as you said, we had a lot of stores around the world. Um, I was on an aeroplane all the time. I found that kind of balance thing <coughs> quite hard. Um, when our eldest daughter went to boarding school, age 11, I remember thinking, God, I, I, I want to be around a bit more. So that was very much part of, part of that decision. But the other thing is, is, for me, when a business gets very big like that, um, it's very hard to maintain the creativity. And I'm a real now, like a lot of entrepreneurs, I'm a real now person. If I've got an idea, I want to do it now. And when a business gets like that, each, you know, you'd go to this department and I'd say, I've got this brilliant idea for a bracelet. And they go, well, you can do that, but you can't do it until nine months or 12 months because the franchise department doesn't know or the marketing department doesn't know or the, you know. I'm like, yeah, I could be dead in nine months. I mean, we, we've just got to do it. So, so I found that, you know, frustrating. And with Anushka, I am absolutely yeah. in control and, and it's, it's very sure. simple, it's a very different, sure. different thing. So you're going back to satisfying your, you know, your entrepreneurial instincts. I think my creativity. Your creativity, yeah. yeah. So we'll talk about Anushka in a minute, but um, you said that one of the reasons was uh, that lack of sense of control, but also the fact that you had a family, you, you had children, you wanted to have a bit more balance in your life. And that's something that, you know, all parents have to think about. And uh, not just women, men and women. But for many, you know, for many of the, the students who come through these doors, who are very driven, who are very ambitious, um, they also think about, you know, their own futures with their families and how they're going to 
make that balance work for them. And I know that you spend a lot of time, you know, you mentor young women, you, you run events for women in business, you're very keen on, on being upfront and honest about that kind of thing. What would you say to, you know, a student here, male or female, who is thinking about the next five years and what they want to achieve, but also about the stresses that, you know, that that might bring for them with a family? Um, look, it is stressful. I mean, the fact is, it is stressful. It's really hard to balance all of those things. I think women are particularly good at it. Um, you know, I, I think that we are perhaps, yeah, perhaps better at it, dare I say. <laughs> Just, <laughs> yeah. um, but, um, you know, I mean, the, the world today is so, is we can do what we want at whatever time we could communicate whenever we want you know if if you're willing to work hard and you know do bath time put children to bed you can still work and afterwards remotely or or you know wherever so I think it's easier now than it's ever been it doesn't mean it's not going to be a challenge you know it's just I mean I I am incredibly lucky that John we set the business up together both of them and I'm very, very lucky because if I can't go to school, you know, to the school play, he could, I could make the meeting, you know, or, or vice versa. And um, I think that's, that's been, I mean, I think I've been particularly lucky. It's maybe a bit unusual that my partner's my husband as well. <laughs> but um, I always say to people when I'm kind of mentoring young, uh, young um entrepreneurs is if you can have a partner it's such a so much less lonely road I think it gives you the flexibility and um, and you know the, there's there's so many ups and so many downs so it's quite nice to share it with somebody you know, yeah. with you. I'm not I sure think that answer your question. Uh, yes yes partly and I'm sure people will have more, more questions about this later but uh, I think for many uh, you know young entrepreneurs there is a sense of the, the clock is ticking you've got to go out and, and do as much as you can mm. are women different entrepreneurs do they do they uh, start businesses and build businesses differently to men oh my goodness that's quite a difficult question <laughs> um, um, I, I mean I think I, I think a lot of women think is now a good time is you know would it be better in five years time when I've had my children I'm not sure there's ever really a perfect time to be to be doing it and do we do it differently I, I think there are a lot more balls in the air that you know there seem to be because inevitably you are balancing either children or just running a house or you know um, I don't know if, if I don't really know the answer whether they do it differently or not we just I don't think there's conclusive evidence either way but it's a question no. that people often ask, they often ask me you know and they, they often um, yeah. I think it's a question that comes up in the press a lot and perhaps it's not even a relevant question perhaps it's more about how you have to live your life I don't I, I, yeah I think it's about how I don't know whether it's about whether they yeah. do it differently I okay. just think you know okay. <laughs> So let's um, just talk a little bit about Anushka, which is, uh, again, a very high-end jewellery business. Um, you finally got to have your name on the packaging and on the product. That wasn't, uh, I should just say, that, that um, was a very, um, very strategic decision with Lynx not to do that, uh, because I, we knew we wanted to sell it. Uh, I didn't want to be as permanently attached to the brand uh, and when we did sell it actually I did a year's consultancy and then that was it so I think um, strategically that was very that was yeah. very important yeah, yeah. okay uh, but this one you you do want to keep this one you you're you're very very attached to um, do you want to say a little bit about how different this is from links just I just yeah. Put some of these slides up while you're well, talking. Well, it would be helpful just to yeah. see. Um, so, well, it's fundamentally different in that it is Anushka is fine jewellery. It's 18 karat gold and stones, uh, semi-precious and precious stones. So, so that it's fundamentally different in its in its aesthetic. Um, it's fundamentally different in that it, uh, it I control all my own distribution. So there's no wholesale. 
there's uh, no franchise, um, there's, uh, there's no duty-free, all of those things which can make a business very complicated. It, it puts lots of layers on it. And that was a deliberate, de a deliberate decision to do that, not to have, yeah. not to have wholesale. And, okay. Yeah. Yeah, very deliberate decision, um, and you know, and it's fundamentally different. It's it's um, links was you know started as cufflinks, then it went to gifts, and jewellery was the kind of last thing I did, um, and this time it's really predominantly it, it is all about jewellery, mainly for women at this point, um, and that's that's different. You know, I'm a woman designing jewellery for women, and I think that's a kind of important part of it. So. When you started Lynx, the business was very different, and to some extent, Lynx did change the way it sort of uh, high-end jewellery was was seen. Um, when we were preparing for this, you talked about the, how the industry has changed in terms of how you reach the customer. Um, how you're selling now uh, is very different to how you were selling when you started Lynx. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, I think. Um, I mean, the the decision. So before you say, we should say these are some of your customers, right? These are some of my customers. I thought you should like to see that. <laughs> no, I'm very lucky. I have an amazing, uh, an amazing raft of very wonderful, remarkable women who choose to wear my jewellery. And yeah. just so everyone knows, I don't give it to them, and I don't pay them to wear it. Oh, so yeah. <laughs> uh, not that I was a bit hopeful, but uh, okay, okay. Um, so yeah, so the distribution system has completely changed, how you sell has changed. Just give us a bit of a sense of how that has happened, what the big differences are. Well, like the landscape's so, so fundamentally different. I mean, uh, uh, for, for Anushka now, it is, we, as I say, we control all our own distribution, so that means um, I sell through my own stores, um, and I have, you know, Two, store, two standalone shops in, in London, one in Hong Kong, um, and the rest are concessions in department stores where I own and control all of the stock, employ the staff, so it puts me very much in, in charge. Um, and obviously the website uh, enables me to sell all around the world um, without having this complicated um, wholesale um, model, which, which is very complicated because if you're selling into third-party retailers, you know, those third-party retailers are always looking for new, they want to, and if it hasn't sold, they want to put it on sale, you might not want it on sale, uh, they're wanting to know what's, you know, what's new, so it's, it, for me it was a bit the tail wagging the dog, whereas this time, um, I'm I'm absolutely in control, and I love the fact that it gives me um, complete free reign on creativity, um, and also it, it means that you know if we want to, um, you know, distribute in a, a new territory, uh, you know, I can either decide to open a Chinese website or uh, absolutely it's just a very different landscape, whereas so much before and so much now if you are in a wholesale world is all about the kind of real estate that you can get in other sure. people's stores if you sort of so what about the ambitions then for the business you you know you want this to be much more something that you're in control of but if it gets bigger and bigger and it is getting bigger I mean you just opened in is it the Mandarin Oriental in, in, in Hong, Hong Kong, Kong. so yeah. um, what are your ambitions for this business Look, I, I, I mean, the ambition, I guess, for the business is, is, I mean, the world's a huge place, but I don't believe we need to open 40 stores around the world anymore. Um, so I think, I think it's not an unrealistic. When, 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 even when we started Nushka in 2009, um, it was unusual to be selling fine jewellery online. Um, and and I, I am constantly amazed of how much money people will spend online. Um, so I think, I think in three or four years' time, I'd like 50% of our turnover to be online. Um, and, you know, that's not to say we won't open another shop anywhere else, but I don't think there is this need to open um, in lots of, different, lots of different places. 
Um, yeah. Right. So for you, you know, for, well, for all the, the people listening here, what, what would you say to them uh, if they were just starting out? What would your top tips be for someone who had an idea that they really wanted to follow? I think, uh, you know, I, I personally believe you really have to love what you do. I am very lucky. I absolutely love what I do. So it doesn't, you know, I, it doesn't feel like it's work all the time. You know, there are bits I like a lot less than other bits, clearly. But um, I think it's really important to, to have some proper enthusiasm and love for what you do. Because ultimately, it takes up let's say it takes up 70% <laughs> of your life, your working life, or your life generally. Um, and I think as you uh, employ people, you have to be able to motivate those people, you have to be able to encourage those people. And if you don't like it, you, they're going to see that very, very fast. <laughs> you know, if it's just about a quick buck, I don't think it's, it, it, you know, it's something that you've just got to be really enthusiastic about. It can't just be about the money. I don't think it's so. not. I know that you you do some work in Ethiopia and you support a microfinance um, initiative. Um, and I think, in fact, we've one of our MBA students has yeah, been out been to, to, yeah, to visit have a look at it yeah. and to, to work with you. Um, just say a little bit about that. I'd like to open up for, for questions in a minute, but say a little bit about that. Um, why you started it and and how important it is in the scheme of what you're doing at the moment. Well, uh, as I said, I, I am um, I am passionate about inspiring women, and I do think um, you know women are very generous in the way that they um, communicate and the way that they share. And um, the microfinance um, project is in in Addis, um, and it's an unbelievably powerful project. So where we will. Uh, where where women will will come from the community, we will teach them over kind of two or three weeks about how to save. First, how to save because they haven't saved anything; they've never done it before. And it, we're talking two p, three p. I mean, it's really, really very, very, very small amounts. And then we'll teach them about how um, to to kind of run a business and what that means. But. I am talking on such a such a kind of basic scale. And it may be that after three weeks, the, one of the women wants to set up a lettuce stand at the end of her road, um, and that just means that she needs to borrow some money in order to go to the market the other side of Addis, buy the lettuce to come back and sell at the at the at the end of her road. But what I found so fantastic and so kind of empowering about it is that. When you when you when I first met a lot of these ladies, they will kind of look at the floor and not quite sure where to look or what to do. And then recently, we've just come back actually last week, and I met a lot of the women who we've helped or have let, who have um, borrowed money from us, and it's thirty pounds which they have to pay back. Um, and they stand tall, they look you in the eye, and they're so proud. And it's, it's so powerful because each of those women touches five or six other members of their family. So actually where we're helping a thousand women directly, um, it's kind of five, six, seven thousand people it actually touches. Um, and I just think that's just so exciting. And so the f now the first, uh, the first group of women are setting up their own cooperative where they're running it. And it just shows what it can be done. Yeah. I think I've asked enough questions. I think we should have some questions from, from all of you. So again, if you can just put your hand uh, up clearly and say, say who you are uh, before you ask your question. So over to you. Gentleman at the back. Hi, Hugh Courtney. Um, you mentioned that you uh, had an, always intended to, or maybe not always intended to sell, but that you intended to sell um, links. How far ahead did you set your plans? And was that something that you saw as a means to an end to be able to get to, to starting Anushka? Um, I guess realistically, we, um, we started that process about three years out. Um, 
Yes, because it's quite a lot to get everything in order. And I remember very clearly uh, John saying to me, every time you want to take a taxi, that pound is going to be seven times more, eight times or nine times or whatever it was, more valuable. So, you know, actually three years out, that was quite helpful. <laughs> and um, so what's the second part of your question? No, I think the two things were totally unrelated. I mean, I think if I'm, if I'm really honest, I thought, um, I thought we would sell links and I'd go and be the perfect mother. And I think quite quickly my children thought I wasn't going to be the perfect mother. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they tell you to go back to work? They did. I think, I, I think we're all agreed on that. We needed to go back to work. Yeah. Please go back to work. Yeah. OK, another question right at the back. Hi everyone, Marianne van der Walt from the Ember Group, S17, and I've got some of my colleagues here as well, so we're very excited to hear your story, Anushka, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm very interested to hear how you built up your network. Um, you initially started very small, and um, I'm very interested to hear how that all developed. The net, the, in, in, Just what? in the sense of having started with the cufflinks and then suddenly there were the 40 stores, uh, who exactly did you come across during that period of growth that assisted you in promoting the product? Um, well, that's quite a, that's quite a, that's quite a long question, but I, <laughs> I mean, I guess the, the 40 stores, as I said, retail was the very last thing we did. Um, but in order to get to the 40 stores, um, we well, first of all, we, the, the wholesale was absolutely vital in, in all of that. Uh, whilst I, uh, I'm not a big fan of wholesale, if I can avoid it, but for me, uh, that was absolutely essential because we had to be put in front of, let's say we're in Harrods, big, a big uh, area in Harrods. You know, that, inter whether, whether they were customers or whether people just seeing us, it was all about brand awareness. Um, so that was very important in terms of building the brand awareness. Um, I think um, inter internationally, um, our I think it was our th I think it was about our third store. Uh, we were approached by BAA, who run Heathrow, and um, they asked us to bid for a for a, a shop there, um, and and that was very very important in terms of international. From that, we then developed franchises, um, and then and then stores in other in other places. So, yeah, I, I, it was kind of just building blocks, I guess. Thank you. Okay, right at the back. If you are a student, if you can say which course you're on. Sure. Um, my name is Bumi Aye. I'm in the MBA class. Um, is it all right if we address a question to your husband? <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> I understand that you are a design entrepreneur yourself, or you are working in the design space yourself, but how were you able to, A, decide to go into business with your wife? Um, what's that relationship like, or the balance of being spouse versus business partner? <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> and I, I think what I also wanted to understand is, because for a lot of men, they probably won't be comfortable with their wives, you know, leading a company to a certain extent. So how were you able to, you know, make that decision and how did you both balance it in terms of your relationship and also for your business? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, John. <laughs> um, I think, well, Links of London, um, Links of London didn't, it, it, it wasn't my name, so it didn't really, it didn't really matter. Um, but I think the, the, the important thing, for us was, John was a lawyer, uh, very, very useful, uh, been fantastically useful throughout, throughout our kind of uh, business. Um, and as Lynx got too big for me to do all, everything, um, we, we needed to find somebody to do it. And other than the fact that he was a frustrated lawyer. <laughs> um, and other than the fact that he was my husband, he was really the obvious person to, to, to do it. Um, but we did, we, we waited until it was big enough to accommodate both of us. So as long as I looked after the creative side, John looks, was always looked after the strategic side. And as long as he doesn't get in my inbox, <laughs> it's fine. It's worked incredibly well. And as I said, the flexibility that it is given us um, 
has been, a, you, you know, he, it's put us in an incredibly uh, advantageous position. But I'll let him answer that. Well, <laughs> <in any> case, uh, <laughs> well all, all, I, all I would say is um, that this type of business, it's a creativity that is the core of the business. And um, if you take away the creativity out of a business like uh, Anushka, you will kill it very fast. But that's not to say that with the creativity, you need the business side alongside. And I think Anushka said a very interesting comment about, you know, it's great to, to run a business in a partnership. I cannot believe how difficult it would be to run a business on your own with all the ups and downs. And having somebody who says, actually, um, don't believe your own bullshit um, on the one hand, and on the other is able to, uh, to um, support when things go wrong. So it's an interesting balance. But I did speak to a very uh, well-known women entrepreneur last night um, who was bemoaning the fact that she'd recently, well, two things, she'd recently sold half a company very well, but sadly she just got divorced. And uh, she said to me that um, her husband, who was in private equity, found it incredibly difficult to deal with her success. And it was very sad, and he had he'd found it almost impossible to support her during the journey. And, um, you know, that's a pretty bad indictment on men, or, you know, that, that, that we can't. And, um, all, you know, I think women do bring something very different to um, entrepreneurialism, because I think they are um, much more measured. Um, they are um, much more intuitive, which is so important at the early stages of a business. They, uh, they, they're better at selecting um, uh, employees often at the early stages, and, and we found that balance very useful. You know, there's always a plant in the audience. Well, um, John isn't exactly the plant, but uh, very interesting comments. Okay, um, perhaps here, and then we'll go somewhere in the middle. Hi, my name is Vic. I'm from the EMBA as well. And uh, you mentioned that it was uh, extremely frustrating for you as Lynx grew to be creative in your own company. Uh, if Anushka grows as well and uh, becomes a larger company in terms of internal structure, uh, don't you think you will face a similar challenger challenge then again? And if that happens, will you want to sell the company, uh, sell Anushka as well? I think as long as as long as the distribution of of Anushka remains in our gift, it, it won't happen, because it's it's the third parties that dictate a lot about that. So I don't see that happening. I think Anushka could could go to a you know a, a huge company, and as long as we are controlling the distribution, we're calling the shots. So, you know, I can tell you, you know, we'll always be able to say, well, we're going to launch this on such and such a date. I haven't got to wait for somebody, you know, halfway across the world to talk to their team about X, Y and Z. Um, couldn't you have done that with Lynx, uh, taken away the third party distribution? Well, I would have taken away a huge amount of turnover uh, and we weren't really in a, we, 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 we as we as we grew, we opened more shops, which were more profitable than obviously uh, wholesale, where you're making half the margin. Next question. So, uh, third row back in the middle. What was so? Remind me. What was the the turnover by the time you sold the business? It was about four, forty million. 40, I think it was 40. a bit more than that. It was about, I think it was about um, forty eight, something like that. About yeah. forty eight million. Yeah. Okay. Um, hey, my name is Shruti. I'm part of the MBA class here. Um, mm. Thank you, firstly, for your time. It was wonderful to hear your journey. Thank you. um, the entrepreneurial journey requires a lot of grit and resilience um, as you go through it, particularly early on, but I imagine throughout your career. Curious to understand more about what motivates you and how did you sustain that, particularly through the challenges and the dark nights and the, you know, the difficulties you face on your journey? Well, it's, as we've said, it's good to do it with somebody who can, you, can, you can share some of those issues with. But it does, you know, it, it, it does require, um, you know, determination and grit. Um, but I, it's so exciting. Do you know that it, it is really, really, it's it's such an exciting journey. And when there's a, a problem, 
it's just like, okay, so how are we going to get over this problem as opposed to thinking, oh my God, it's a, you know, it, it, it. so it, I think the motivation um, comes from really enjoying enjoying what you do, and um, and I think motivation comes from the people you surround yourself with. I think that's really important that you can spar off each other, um, you know, and and choosing the right team um, so that there is real motivation amongst amongst your team um, as well. But you know, there's no doubt that it's 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 hard work. But it's for me, it's just more fun that I'm doing the hard work for myself rather than for someone else, <laughs> if I'm honest. <laughs> um, another question. Another question. Hi. And then we'll go Kay. right to the back afterwards. Hi Anushka, I'm Hildin. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us. I work as a social innovation manager. Uh, and in fact, I think I helped John to to place Macarena in Ethiopia, so it was a very interesting journey. Uh, I was wondering, just a very interesting question, if you have a was asked by someone to design something really, really unique, really, really unusual, and what was it? Oh, goodness. <coughs> the thing that comes to mind, I'm not actually that keen to share with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's just it's a bit a weird. <laughs> it's a very private setting here, so... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just trying to, I mean, I do, you know, I design engagement rings, I design, um, you know, things which, which are really special to each individual person. I've just done a, um, a collaboration, actually, which is um, with somebody called Susie Cave. Um, we, haven't, we haven't actually launched it yet, but she, the, Susie Cave is married to somebody called Nick Cave, uh, who's a singer. And um, or a rock star, I think it's probably. And she wanted to design um, a collection of charms inspired by the lyrics of his songs. Um, and one is, you know, is a electric chair. One is a <laughs> gun. Um, and there are quite some, so some quite subversive charms uh, along along in that in that particular collection. And you know. I, would I have done an electric chair otherwise? Absolutely not. But it's really cool. I'm really <laughs> pleased with it. Um, but there are, you know, there are, um, it, it, it's such a, per designing a piece of jewelry is so personal. So it's a journey that you take together with, with the person who's commissioning you. Anyway. We had one question right at the back. Rob Asplin, an executive MBA. Um, how's Lynx performed since you sold it and since you were um, uh, no longer working there? And if it did have a wobble, would you go back in and try again? I'm not sure it's performing perfectly, <laughs> um, but I don't. I, do you know what? I I don't really know how it's performing, um, and I, I I think I'm thinking about how to answer this. <laughs> um, I don't think I would go back in now. Uh, it's it's been you know we sold it in 2006, so it's made some it's changed a lot since the day uh, we sold it. And I think um, I'd find it very hard, emotionally, in lots of ways, to go back to it now. It was a bit like selling a fifth child. It's a, you know, it's weird. <laughs> it's a weird feeling. I'm going to jump in here a bit. So you, mm. did, so you did stay for a year. As a consultant. As a consultant. Yeah. And that's often, for an entrepreneur, that's often a really difficult time. It was the worst they, time. Where there's a worst time. <laughs> what, was, what was worst about it? Well, I tell you, actually, the worst thing about it was I was asked to design all sorts of things that I just didn't really understand why. You know, men's ties, sunglasses. I was just like, I, I just didn't really get it. And I... <laughs> I found that very, very hard. Yeah. Um, and I, it's I mean, a classic uh, thing when yeah. business is sold and the founder stays for a bit, but then leaves not very happy. Yeah, you, you know, I, 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 we were incredibly lucky. We, we, we both had to consult, but only two days a week for you know for a year. So it was actually a fairly short time, but quite painful. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, some more questions. <laughs> Um, so I think, Sam, you asked a question a while ago, so you go first and then at the back. Okay. 
Hi, I'm Sam, uh, alumni of the Ember class. Um, I just wanted to ask around the mentorship that you now do. Uh, I know that you said that your mum was one of your mentors to begin with, but did you have a mentor um, through the Links of London um, experience and, you know, um, onwards? And is that, a, you know, is it, has that had any influence in you becoming a mentor and having mentorship, mentorship pro programs? Um, that's really interesting. I there wasn't anybody specific. I mean, I, I know this sounds unbelievably kind of you know yuck, but actually, John, <laughs> it was a, a very very lucky because we are you know I'm very creative and he's very strategic. Um, so that was it was it was a fantastically you know it it, it was a it made it made lots of sense. Um, but over the over the course of of um, starting Links of London and, and all through my career, um, I have met unbelievable women, men, um, who have, you know, who, and, and, and I, I, I speak specifically about women because actually it's very, I found it very easy to communicate very honestly with women and just to say, look, actually, what would you do? Well, this is what I do, you know, um, and it's, it's just a, it's it's been it's been incredibly helpful, but I'm not sure that there was one individual person, um, which I think perhaps is why I really enjoy mentoring because I think it does help. And actually, if I'd had somebody uh, to you know say don't do this or do it this way, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that you, th that might have been very very helpful. Um, yeah. So we have a question right at the back. Yeah, uh, two questions next to each other, and then. On this side. Um, I have a question about Tad Bohannon. I'm from the IMBO program. And I have a question about your initial capitalization. Uh, you talked early on that you needed to produce some and you find it was easier just to produce twice as many. And then a big step was going to the bank. So early on, I mean, source of funds, just professional careers, source of funds. I mean, where did. Where did your funding come from? You know, at the beginning, it, w it, it wasn't very expensive. It really wasn't very expensive. It, so I got a better deal by doing double. Uh, so <laughs> I just thought the margin would be better if I did double. Um, but the, the source of funds uh, so initially came from 50-50. I think we put £1,000 each. Um, so it was very, you know, it was very small <laughs> then. Um, but going to the bank was a was a different thing. That was about the branding and being able to kind of um, create an identity, which was which was the most expensive bit at that stage. Hi, Monique Rodriguez, um, Imba is 17. Um, talking about strategy and then looking forward into the future, what are what is the next big thing for for jewelry, and uh, what are the trends, and how do you pick up on that? I mean, uh, that's a really difficult question because <laughs> the trends are changing all the time and body jewellery is becoming bigger and bigger and um, more and more women are putting more and more piercings. I mean, it's, it's, it's really interesting how that's changed since, I, since, since we started Anushka in 2009. You know, 50-year-old um, you know, women, and there's a, um, a business in Liberty that is all about uh, piercing. And their average customer is 48, I think, and they're putting multiple. So it's, it's changing enormous ways. So if I'd said to my children, actually, I'm going to put, you know, six things in, in my ears, they would have looked at me. Now they think it's really cool. But um, so I, I, think it, I think it is really changing. Um, and the landscape for jewellery, certainly since, since we started Anushka, has changed very, very considerably. Um, from you know when we started, there was very little between Cartier and Links of London, um, and and now you know I must meet I don't know maybe ten jewelers a month, ten people who are you know jewelry designers. So it's it, it, it's just it's just different. I think one of the challenges is is about materials because obviously you're permanently you know worrying about the gold price or the diamond price and. You know, and the and the exchange rate, and the you know all of those things. So it's perhaps dic the, some of those trends might be dictated by you know by the materials, etc. 
I know that we haven't had, we, we only have time really for uh, one more question, but we haven't had anyone else from this side of the room yet. So I think somebody's, yeah, right at the back. Hi, I'm Sandra. I'm on the MBA as well. Um, and my question, maybe not a great one to end the night with, it might be a little inflammatory, but um, here at SAID <laughs> we spend a lot of time talking about responsible business and social impact in business and how those things interrelate. Um, and not just in terms of how can you do business responsibly and ethically, but how can you do it with a purpose? How can you do it to solve bigger problems? Um, and I was really intrigued by Hilden's question and your response to it. And I'm just curious to know uh, what you think the role of sort of politics or uh, social impact is um, as, a, as a head of a company, as an entrepreneur, but specifically as a jewelry designer, um, has there ever been a line that you've done that's been political? Um, and if not, would you get political with your designs, with your jewelry? Um, and what would that issue be for you? Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> good question. The answer is I haven't uh, done a political, I haven't taken a political line. Um, I think when you're growing a business, uh, you know, Anushka is still pretty, pretty young. It's 2009. Um, I think to take a political angle is pretty dangerous if you're trying to expand your market and not alienate this group or this group. So I and I don't foresee changing my view on that particularly at, at, at this stage. But I am very, very careful about where you know making sure where my gold comes from where they're making sure that the where the diamonds come etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but i don't uh, i have never taken a political view um, uh, who knows <laughs> okay that's a good question very good mm. question um so i think probably we should uh retire and all enjoy a drink and nushka and, and john are going to stay with us i know some of you are joining us for dinner um, so there'll be a chance to ask more questions, more informal questions outside. But I suppose I just want to have um, interviewers' privilege and ask one more question, which is that, you know, if you were advising any young person who really wanted, to, desperately wanted to start a business, um, and you, you know, you would try to give them a couple of pieces of advice, what, what would you say? Um. Well, assuming that they're loving what they're doing. Yeah, assuming they assuming have the passion they're for loving what, what they're doing. doing. Um, I think, I think um, one of the th one of the one of the things I, I've kind of learned is you know, the art of delegation is absolutely fundamental if you're going to grow a business successfully. Yeah. The, one of the hardest things I think to learn when you've done everything. It's very hard because you always think it's going to be quicker to do it yourself, um, and um, and also. When the time comes, not to be frightened to employ people better than you. I think that's really, really important. If you are in a position where you can, it's a, it's a fantastic thing. <laughs> Great. OK. Take notes, guys. Um, Anushka, thank you very much. It's been a great evening. I'm so pleased you could come and join us. And I hope, I hope that you will think about perhaps getting more involved with entrepreneurship here at the school and uh, that this won't be your last visit as well as your first. So thank you very much thank indeed. Thank you very much.